Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today on Cajun Women's National Women's Day at Women of the World Festival. Um, and thank you very much for Women of the World for putting this on the agenda of the festival this year. And it's very much an honour um, to be asked to take part. My name is Christiane Cavalier. I'm Director of Partnerships for Their World, which is a charity set up by Sarah Brown in 2002 to help children through health and education initiatives um, have the, the best start in life. Among other things, I, I lead on all things girls in education within their world. Um, in a minute, we're going to be linking up with Cambridge, and Cambridge can actually hear us at the moment. Um, can I just ask if there's anyone in the room who, we have a uh, BSL sign interpretation here today, if there's anyone here that would find that useful to continue, if you could just make, you know, stick your hand up. Okay. <laughs> so to, today we're here to discuss the education emergency because there, there is currently an education emergency. 58 million children in the world that will never currently see a day of school. 28 million of those children are, are living in emergency and conflict zones and over half of those um, 31 million are girls, with even higher proportions forced to drop out, mainly due to reasons driven by poverty before they even finish. These are really shocking numbers, and we're just talking about primary school, by the way. If we include secondary school, the numbers are much higher than that. But they're even more shocking, given that we know how to solve this. We know how to build schools. We know how to, to train teachers. There's no magic cure that needs to be invented in order to solve this problem. What we need is the political will and the financing in place in order to make this happen. Um, of course, it's never that simple, and that's what we're here to discuss today. <laughs> but it's just to make the point that really this is something that's very solvable um, today. So just to introduce um, our panel, we have uh, in London here, and then I'll ask Cambridge to introduce their panel. Uh, we have Bela Jamil. Uh, much loved and respected for her years of work um, in advancing education in Pakistan. Um, Bela is an education activist, a member of the South Edu Asia Forum for Education Development and also head of the ITA. And she recently established the first child marriage free zone in Pakistan. <laughs> We have Vanessa Ogden here today, who's the head of uh, Mulberry School for Girls in East London. Vanessa has over 1,400 girls aged 11 to 19 and was recently named Woman of the Future Mentor of the Year for her work with the school and her campaign for the highest quality education in inner city schools. Joining her is one of her students, Maria Arnim, who is uh, from the sixth form at Mulberry School for Girls. I'm expecting views of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we have Pyle Dal Dalal, who is head of the girls' education programs for Standard Chartered. And for Francesca De Molle, who's um, one of our global youth ambassadors. And, and has been training young people on how to run campaigns uh, and, and voluntary services. So thank you everyone for joining us. I think we're going to link up with Cambridge now on screen so that you can see everyone. Good afternoon, London. Um, I'm chairing in Cambridge and I'm Barbara Stocking. I'm currently president of Murray Edwards College in Cambridge. Um, I was previously chief executive of Oxfam for 12 years, so obviously spent a rather large part of my time thinking about girls' education, women's education right around the world. On my left here, I have Professor Pauline Rose, who is now Professor of International Education in Cambridge, but many people will know her because for a number of years she's been producing UNESCO reports that give that very clear picture of the state of education for boys and girls um, around the world. Next to her we have Zoa Hedges-Stock, 
Um, Zoa grew up um, actually as a, with the, tra the, the showman travellers, um, so she has really learned how to get education the hard way, but she then came to Cambridge, to Murray Edwards College, and fairly recently left with a first class degree from Cambridge, and now works as a journalist at London 24. Uh, next to her is Fatima Yukuba. Um, she is uh, representing with Lucy Lake also on her left, CAMFED today. Uh, CAMFED focuses particularly on, on girls' education. Fatima is an alumna of the Think of the Programmes. She's a practicing nurse and from Ghana, and she is very well able to tell us um, why education is so important. Lucy Lake from CAMFED itself. <coughs> And on my far uh, left is um, uh, Mariam Kalik. Now, Mariam is a head teacher from the Swat Valley in Pakistan. She is the teacher who taught Malala. Um, so she is absolutely wonderful to have here today because she will tell us about the education situation in Swat Valley now but also about the bravery of both the girls and the teachers who are trying to continue education there. So we have a fantastic panel at our end. So would our people here... Yeah. Uh, Christian, yes, I think you're going to do a final bit of introduction yes. on, on the hashtag. So yeah. Yes, that's right. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit um, about for International Women's Day. We've been running the Girls Stand Up for School campaign where we've been asking people globally um, to sign up for a petition which calls world leaders to account for all children to be in school globally. And this International Women's Day, we're highlighting the 31 million girls in the world who are currently not see a day of school. Um, you might have seen online We've had lots of celebrities and key influencers posting their school pictures. Shortly you'll see a presentation with all of our school pictures. <laughs> um, and, and also, I think in Cambridge, I think yours all gonna, are all going to flash behind you as well. Um, so if you're tweeting today, please hashtag up for school, um, as well as... Sorry, I've got the, um, the wow hashtags here. Twitter is at wowtweetuk and hashtag... Wow, LDN. Right. So anything you tweet today, um, please use those hashtags and please go away, sign the petition, please encourage um, your friends and families to sign the petition too. And if you can dig out your old school photo, um, that's quite a fun way to do it. Thanks very much. So I think we're gonna, we, we've got some questions to debate now, Barbara, and then we're going to link up and discuss the answers afterwards. Yes, we link up again at quarter to three. We'll be ready. Great. See you um, I think we're each going to introduce the questions at our end, so we'll, we'll say goodbye to you for the time so being. We'll sign off for now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Great. And we'll say goodbye, Cambridge. Yeah, bye, bye. London. Bye. <laughs> right, are we now off? <laughs> yeah, they're gone. Right, so let me tell you um, about the three questions that we're just going to talk about. So I'm going to ask all of our speakers now just to introduce <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that here, we're going to get on. What I'm, go I'm going to just tell you though is the three questions that we're going to report back to London and they to us at the end. The three questions are, why does girls' education matter so much? Then, what can be done to get more girls in school and enable them not to drop out? And then the third one, where there's extreme violence uh, to stop girls going to school, what can those of us in the outside world do to support those students and those schools? So it's not that people have been asked to um, do their presentations just directly to answer those questions, but those, those are the, the underlying questions that we will pick up and we will report back on uh, when we meet with London again. But I think by now you're all dying to hear somebody actually t um, talk to us about some of the issues. So I'm going to really go straight ahead. And the first person who's going to speak to us is Professor Pauline Rose, who's going to give us an overview of the situation now. So Pauline, off you go. You. So I'm going to stand up here because I want to wave my arms at the screen so it's a bit easier to do from here. Um, I'm glad to see that our old school photos haven't been revolving on the <laughs> screen there. <laughs> I, we were wondering what they were going to do, but there at the moment. Uh, thankfully, we're just going to see some of my slides instead. It's a great privilege to be here, and I think it's a great honour to be actually discussing the education emergency on International Women's Day. I, 
personally think probably one of the most important issues that should be discussed and raised on this important day. Um, we know, as was heard, that there are 50 million children out of school, and yet in 2000, world leaders came together to say that by 2015, this year, all children should have completed primary school. They shouldn't only be in school, but they should be completing primary school. So there are millions and millions of children around the world who still haven't realized this right to an education. Now, some of these children are in particular countries or particular parts of those countries, and we're going to hear some of the real life experiences from some of our panel shortly. But what I'm going to start by just giving an overview of some of the facts and figures that put this into perspective, I think. So first of all, education is a right. Everybody, whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're rich or poor, whether you have a disability or you don't have a disability, you have a right to education. However, there are groups of children around the world who are more likely not to have this right. And yet, some of those, many of those who actually as with others, deserve this right, are ones that are going to make the biggest difference, not only to their own lives, but also to the lives of their society. And girls in particular, the education of girls, makes a massive difference, not only to themselves, not only to their own self-confidence, to their own feeling of self-worth, but also to society more broadly. So on this screen, uh, this is from the Education for All Global Monitoring Report that, as Barbara just mentioned, I, I was directing, and these slides are all on the website. You can find more information there. But these paint, I think, quite an important picture that we can see, for example, at the top there, childbirth, that if you educate women to have at least a secondary education, it will mean that of those who are currently dying in, current, in childbirth, two out of three will survive. Similarly, if we educate all women to at least lower secondary education in countries where there's high levels of infant mortality, children are more likely to survive. One in two children who are currently dying before they reach their first birthday will be able to live a fulfilling life. That's three million lives being saved. Similarly, educating girls to lower secondary education means that they're more likely to be nourished, they're more likely to be healthy, that by educating girls to lower secondary level, their children are more likely to be nourished. We're going to be ensuring that 12 million children actually no longer suffer from mal malnourishment. At the same time, many girls around the world are being forced to get married early. Sometimes this is at very early ages at the age of 12 or 15, um, sometimes when they only just about reach puberty, they're, they're leaving school and getting married. By educating girls to at least secondary education, it means that we're going to save two out of three or, of those children, of those young girls, from getting married early and instead ensuring they have an education and are then able to make their own life choices. And one of those life choices is when they start to have children. So in many countries around the world, children are having, uh, girls are having children before the age of 17, before they're actually making the decisions themselves about whether they want a family, how many children they want, and so on. By educating girls to lower secondary education, making sure that they are able to make choices and negotiate these choices more successfully, it will mean that there will also be fewer young girls having giving birth early, which puts not only their child's health at risk, but also their own health at risk. And lastly, it also means, by educating girls to at least secondary education, means that we're moving towards equal pay for both men and women. So it has benefits for the future as well. So there are many benefits to girls' education. It's, it's, there's, there's no reason, in a sense, not to educate girls. And yet the reality is, that if you're a girl, you're less likely to both be in school and complete school. So I find this probably one of the most sobering statistics, that we see that if you're a poor girl living in a rural part of a poor country, even today, you're only likely to be spending three years in school. So world leaders, as I said, had committed to making sure all children complete primary schooling by 2015. Three years means that in most societies they're at least two years or even three years short of completing a primary school cycle. 
three years in school means that you're leaving school before you can probably, you've probably gained basic literacy and numeracy skills. And even if you had gained those, you're likely to lose them because you haven't been in school long enough to consolidate them. But this isn't a problem for, for, for children in these countries, for all children in these countries. As we can see, if you're a rich boy from these same countries, living in an urban area from most more privileged parts of the country, you're in school for at least 10 years. So there are schools there, there are, there are facilities available, but it's a question as who gets access to them. Now, what this means is that actually we've got a very long way to go. We're in 2015, and I think we now recognise we're not going to achieve the goal of getting all children to complete a primary school by the end of this year. It doesn't mean we should give up, and I think the Up for School campaign is part of that message. We need to keep pushing world leaders to make sure that they fulfil the commitment that they made themselves. But if we continue on current trends, if we continue with business as usual, it's actually going to be at least 70 years before these poor girls from these poorest countries are going to reach the finishing line for getting into for completing primary school, and another century before they complete secondary education. Now, I think that's inconceivable in this country that we could imagine that it's going to be a century before girls are going to be completing secondary education. And I think this is, this is the reality. If we continue on the trends that we've been seeing, then we're going to be in a major crisis for the next round of goals that world leaders are now debating about making sure that not only do all children complete primary school, but they also complete secondary school, and on top of that, that importantly, they're learning as well. So world leaders are setting themselves higher ambitions by 2030 to achieve even more than they were supposed to achieve by 2015, and yet they haven't achieved what they've achieved by 2015, and things aren't in place yet to change that picture. One important thing that is happening in the debates about where we go from here to 2030, to this new set of goals, is that world leaders are recognising that these goals need to focus on leaving no one behind. And that was one of the problems that we've had previously, that there was not a focus on the most marginalised, on the most disadvantaged, and that's why we've seen this very unequal pattern. To change this pattern, we need to start focusing attention on those most marginalised in society to make sure that they have the opportunity of catching up. Now, if we don't, what this is doing, and this, what this has done up until now, is leaves a legacy of children and young people who can't read or write. So this is the numbers of children who cannot read even a sentence. You have young people who can't read even a sentence. 175 million young people aged 15 to 24 can't read a single sentence. That's three times the population of the UK, at half the size of the US. Huge numbers of young people who can't even read a basic sentence. Six out of ten of those young people are girls. So there's a huge challenge of the legacy of an education system, and this legacy is going to continue after this 2015 deadline as well. And again, if we don't do something about the new generation of children, we're going to be seeing a similar pattern again by 2030. But there are things that we can do, and I think as we were hearing from London, this Up for School campaign is one of the things that is really trying to bring attention of everyone around the world, of children, of young people, and of world leaders, to say, we can't put up with this anymore, that we have to stand up for school. So here we can see we've got children in Delhi, in Dakar, in Nairobi, the Prime Minister of Norway, together with the former Prime Minister of Australia, the, this is Bela Jamil, who was on the other end of the um, line there from London, with the governor from the Punjab in Pakistan. And finally, our own very own vice chancellor, all signing up for school and standing up for school. Now, I have to say, I think that here in Cambridge, having the vice chancellor standing up for school is a great privilege and really makes me proud to be here in Cambridge. And I think it's something that means that we, as a community in Cambridge, should follow his lead. If you haven't already, on your way out, sign the petition. I'm sure you're going to be reminded again. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Pauline. That was a great start, a great picture. Um, the next person who's going to speak is Mariam Kalik, and, and I hope the um, projection is getting the video ready because um, Mariam is going to tell us um, her own story and, and really give us a, an update really about what is happening um, to girls in Pakistan, particularly in the Swat Valley in education. And she's going to start that by showing a short two-minute video of the girls who are there now, I think. को किस तरह पूरी कर, करेंगे अपने माँ बाप के ख्वाहिशात को किस तरह पूरी करेंगे तो हम हमारे जहन में बहुत ज़्यादा टेंशन था कि हम किस तरह मतलब किस तरह आगे जा सकेंगे अपने मुल्क को किस तरह बुलंद करेंगे समाज सोच अलग बदल चुकी माँ का लेती था माँ को तो कतल लखन को दीजिए बाह कोल तो मैं कतल जनों को स्कूल में मना कोल तो मैं कतल न जमा बस सोच क्यों खबर ला लेती आया पर इस्लाम का खुदा निश्चित अल्लाह तल फरमाये तल बुलिन उन फरीज़ तो मलाक को ली मुस्लिम उन वह मुस्लिम तो इन्हों चीज ये उदासी بی علم بی علم خزه سگیریشی او خونا سدخبل وطن نپاره سکوالشی نه دا لکه زو چه دکتر جورشی دخبل وطن مدد کوالشی دا میری بانانو مدد کوالشی با بعضی مخاطرات که داخل کودیت زیاد پکار رات لیشی چه بی علم خزه نه او اس چه چنون دخبل وطن دخبل آوان دا پاره نشی کوالی او نه دخبل آن دا پاره زن خود پاره نشی अगर हम कुछ करें अगर तालीम हासिल करें तो हम आगे जाकर इस मुल्क को तरक्की पर कर सकते हैं इस मुल्क को बुलंद परवास कर सकते हैं ये जालिम ये नहीं सोचते कि किसी की बेटी होगी किसी का बाप होगा मतलब वो कुछ भी नहीं सोचते मैं सोचती हूँ कि जब ये लोग दमा के करते हैं तो ये इस तरह नहीं सोचते कि इनमें बहुत सारी जाने भी जाय हो सकती है लेकिन वो सेंसलेस होते हैं मैं सेंस नहीं होती मैं बड़ी होकर डॉक्टर बनना चाहती हूँ आ उनको बहुत शौक था उन वो कहते थे कि मैं मैं अपनी बेटी को डॉक्टर बनना वो देखना चाहती हूँ और वो भी पढ़ाई में बहुत मदद करते थे हमारे In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be here on this very auspicious day, the Women's Day. I have always been advocating girls' education. I have presented strong points, strong arguments against early childhood marriages, uh, child labor, women's rights. The scope of my talks have always been limited to women empowerment and girls' access to education. But here I can't stop myself expressing deep grief and sorrow for the children who lost their lives in Peshawar massacre on 16th of December 2014 in Peshawar. This act deeply injured the souls of the people all around the world. These little angels who went to school with great enthusiasm, little did they know that they will be subjected to such a brutality. It deeply hurts me when I have to say that the size of, the, size of these little angels are still being heard posthumously, thus agonizing our heart. The question now is, where do we stand when I talk of girls' education? Let me tell you from my experience that gender discrimination, women, not only in Pakistan, but all around the world, 
women are being deprived from their basic human rights. They don't have the right and freedom to be themselves, to pursue their dreams, to play a pivotal role in social, economical, and political life. And most importantly, they don't have the basic right to get their basic education that unlocks the doors of all other rights. Today, 58 million children are out of school, and majority of them are girls. In my own Swat Valley, there are 1,013 schools for boys and 603 schools for girls. I must repeat it, it's 1,013 schools for boys and 603 schools for girls, while the number of women population is larger than men. This means that half of the girls don't have schools at all, if, even if they wish to go to. Most of the parents don't like co-education, and in this way, girls stay at home if there is no school in the neighborhood. A teenage girl must have a male escort to take her uh, to school, um, um, otherwise she has to stay at home. I know how Zainab in my neighborhood was stopped by her brothers. Uh, she was extremely <coughs> sad, but couldn't protest in front of them. Some cultures are world apart when it comes to girls' right and access to education. In developed countries, it is socially unlawful and uh, uh, it is unacceptable if a child within the school hours remains at home without any reason, while in developed countries, it's vice versa. We saw how the extremists bombed more than 2,000 schools and banned girls to be going to school. <coughs> In 2009, girls used to hide their books under their shawls as to pretend that they are not school students because they were banned. The Taliban leader used to announce the names of the girls on the FM radio uh, for, quitting, uh, this, uh, for quitting, who were quitting uh, their schools. He would publicly appreciate the parents and their uh, daughters who quit the schools, uh, who has uh, quit Western education. It is quite interesting that Talibanization has always been successful in patriarchal societies as both share their suppressive treatment of women. Both think women as an inferior being and agree, them, agree on confining them uh, within the four walls of their homes. Other barriers in girls' access to uh, education is poverty, child labor, early child marriages, social norms and traditions, and most importantly, the availability of basic facilities. Education becomes a distant dream for the parents of those who live from hand to mouth. A family who does not have enough food and shelter would hardly think of sending their children to school. And if they can, they will send their boys and not girls. A family having six daughters and one son, son will send their son to school and they won't feel any shame if their girls remain without any schooling. The sisters will have to take care of the brothers, shoes, clothes, bags, uh, books, everything. And they themselves will be just wasting their precious ta uh, talent inside their homes until uh, their parents find a husband and ship them to another house. Many girls are suffering from domestic child labor and they work in rich people's homes. They used to take care of the children of their age and wash their clothes and dishes. It deeply hurts me when I hear a rich woman uh, saying without an iota of guilt, search a girl for me to work at home. Similarly, child marriages are a great barrier in girls' pursuance of education. I remember how two beautiful girls, they were my students in grade nine, they were very bright, they got married all of a sudden, we persuaded the parents, but all in vain. Their aim is ultimately a girl has to get married and just she has to deliver babies and look after them. Social norms and traditions also don't favor girls' education. What many think that modern education brings liberty and vulgarity in girls' behavior. They love perfectly submissive and obedient girls. Education gives open thinking and confidence that men can't tolerate. <laughs> so girls are kept aloof from the kind of learning that gives them emancipation. Here I would say that development without women's participation is an illusion 
and women's participation in all kinds of development uh, without education is the cry for the moon. Um, there are, uh, governments must take it a top priority if they are really serious in the peace and prosperity of their nations. There are 66 million girls who don't have access to school. Majority of them uh, belong to the countries that are suffering from wars and conflicts. Schools are bombed and people are not safe. So the international community and the concerned governments must ensure the uh, security and safety of the children who go to school. Governments must face up to their responsibility and provide <coughs> schools, uh, not only schools, but standard schools uh, and all basic facilities for girls across the world. Uh, at last, I would say uh, that um, nobody can deny the uh, benefits of education for girls, especially in our society. It is totally, it's, now there is awareness, but it's totally unacceptable for some men to take their daughters and wives to get education. But they don't know that it is the power of education that today my student Malala, she is the youngest ever Peace Prize uh, laureate. So nobody can deny that. And I would, uh, at last I would like to wish you all a very happy Women's Day. And I would also like to wish all the men a very happy Women's Day because I think that um, women is a sign of love, life, and I think the women add meaning to your life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marianne. Really great to hear your story. And now we have another story. First of all, we have a, well, we have two people representing Camfed. Lucy Lake is just going to introduce Camfed and introduce Fatima, um, who's going to tell us your story from Ghana. Thanks, Barbara. So just to give a, a few words um, as a backdrop um, around Camfed before passing on to my colleague Fatima. So Camfed supports girls to go to school and then enables young women to step up as leaders of change. And the focus of our work is in rural areas of sub-Saharan Af Africa, recognising that this is where girls face severe disadvantage, but where their education will have a transformative impact. But it's really the how we support girls to school, which is critical in achieving that transformative impact. And the way we work is to support groups of girls to go to school within a community in order really to bring a spotlight onto the particular challenges and obstacles that they face, not just getting into school, but in going through school and in, and in succeeding at the other end. And in so doing, we bring around girls all those in authority over her, including traditional leaders, including patriarchal authorities who may be against girls' education, in order to demonstrate and convince what is, to show what is possible when girls do go to school. And for them to recognise that their support and their resources are needed in order for us to overcome those challenges and enable young women to succeed. And I think one of the outcomes of that approach is that girls' context changes. Because we recognise that you know, if we're going to shift girls' prospects, then we do have to transform their context. And we don't want a situation where girls go through school and then feel they have to flee their communities and go elsewhere, go to town in order to be able to move on. We want to create the environment in which girls can succeed and become leaders within their communities. And that's what uh, Fatima and her colleagues in CAMA, which is the Alumni Association <coughs> of Young Women who've completed school with CAMFED support, are about. And there are over 25,000 of them now, growing to 130,000. Last year, CAMFED's programs reached 2.2 million young people. But the CAMA network, these are young women empowered within their communities themselves supported 164,000 children to go to school. So the multiplier effect that is achieved in those communities when you do have young women coming through as leaders is transformational. But in supporting girls to go to school, it isn't just about girls and their families sitting back and waiting for CAMFED to come forward with the resources. It is about a partnership to face the toughest of challenges to get girls into and through school. And uh, families are making significant sacrifices in order to enable girls to go to school. And this is where CAMFED comes in as a partner to help overcome some of the obstacles that seem insurmountable. 
this point, I want to, to pass over to my colleague, Fatima, just to give a bit more insight into that and to, to share your story, Fatima, of going through school. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficiary, the most merciful, I greet you all here. I am Yaqubu Fatima from Ghana, um, a beneficiary of Comfort. Yeah, I am from a family of 14, and I happen to be the 13th born of the family and the only educated girl or the only educated person in the family, yes. And I have to take care of all these siblings, these 14 siblings, through the little I'm getting from working as a practicing nurse in Ghana. Yes, I started my education in the basic school level, which was free for everyone. But when I graduated to go to the junior high school, there comes the problem because there was no money, enough money for me to go to school. And I said, no, I have to go to school because I cherish nursing and I want to be a nurse in future. So my mother took it upon herself to sell her belongings in order to support me go to school because we were not having money. And my dad said, no, it's a waste of time since she can't do it by herself and there is no enough money for me to complete after my junior high school. But my mom said, no, she has to. She started selling her belongings and she had enough money to send me to school by then. That was junior high school. So when I started, I said, no, I have to help my mother because human beings don't just have to depend on one for survival. No, you must take your own challenge into consideration and struggle hard in order to earn a living because time waits will never be gained back. So with this, I was able to get some few money. I was giving money to buy some books. I didn't use it. I got a copy from my friend. So I used that money to buy chewing sticks. As you can see me carrying sticks. There are sticks back in Ghana we use in place of paper sedent and brush. We chew to brush our teeth in the morning and also in the night before going to sleep. So I started this business in order to support my mother so that I'll be able to complete my education. So I started selling this every morning, 4 a.m. I wake up very early, 4 a.m., carry these sticks. You can see me there carrying the sticks. Carry these sticks to the market, sell it before going to school. And after school, I have to come back, pick these sticks and sell again in order to get my bursary needs in school and also get some monies to feed on. So I did this for the rest of my junior high school stay. And after selling, I have to come home and learn. And during that time, the, the economic status in my family was very bad. So we wasn't having electricity in the house. But I still have to study and make it great in future. So I was studying under this smoky lamp, which affected my eyes. As you can see, it's red. Today is better. Yeah, it affected my eye, the smokes. I used to sit in front of the smoking lamp and study. And I was doing this every day after the hard work. And with that, I had a problem now. I have to use a spectacles when I'm going to read. Yeah, and after the junior high school, I, I got admission to the senior high school. And my father thought it wise, yes, he saw the impact I'm bringing and also the hard work I'm doing just to support myself. So he said, okay, he has only two animals in his possession. That was a sheep. So he, he saw one of the animals, a sheep, for me to further my education. And my mother also sold the rest of her belongings and supported me go to the senior high school. When I went, I com continued doing this work. And every day I had to walk. My house to the school was very far. Every day I had to walk three hours from the house to the school. And sometimes I was gotten by rain. The rain would beat me mercilessly when I get to school. I have to remove all my clothes and dry them, sit in a class like that. When it's dry, then I pick them to wear. But all this thing, I said, no, I have to struggle and make it great in future. 
So I was still struggling and selling the sticks after school. After the long walk, I would come back home, sell the sticks, and also sit under the lamp just to study. I did this till I completed my senior high school. And after completing the senior high school, I was promised by a relative to come to the capital of Ghana, that is Accra, to work in order to get enough money to go through my tertiary institution. So I, I didn't hesitate to go, and when I went, there was a hell. I was <laughs> working like a slave without being paid. I work in the restaurant, I do her household choices. She was a teacher. I go to help her in the classroom. I did a lot of things would have been paid, and the nutrition, my food was so bad, so I got stomach problem. I fell ill, and she sent me down north for my parents to take care of. So when I got down north, my mother couldn't afford to send me to the hospital. But she got some local help for me to recover. And when I recovered, I said, no, I just don't have to relax. I have to end this battle successfully. So I started selling my sticks again, and I applied to the orphanage. You can see me holding children. And the uniform out there for us, that was the orphanage. When I applied, I had the job, and I was working there as well. I work, and after working, I would still go and sell my sticks. And with this, I was able to gather enough money to apply for my nursing, which was my dream. And when I applied, out of 600 students, I was part of the lucky 94 applicants who was paid to continue their education as nurse. So I, when I had the admission, my dream of becoming a nurse almost got shattered because the fees I was supposed to pay, no, I couldn't just afford it. So I was always indoors crying every day, crying, crying to the Almighty to grant me that opportunity to go to school. But a friend came by and talked to me about comfort. And there I applied for support there. And gladly, they stood up to help me continue my education, which was hmm, a, a, a great thing they did for me. They rekindled my hope of becoming a nurse in future. So when I, they got me to school, I said, no, I have to study very hard to make comfort proud to make my mom my priority, very proud, my role model. So I studied very hard, and I had good grades in the college. I have a good certificate, and now I work as a professional nurse back in Ghana. With all the struggles, To, to, to go through all this suffering and challenge myself to do great in future. And with the help of comfort, yes, I am great. Now I am great. Frankly speaking, I am great. I serve <laughs> as a role model to a lot of young women out there. And I entreat every soul here and out there to take up their challenges into their own hands. You can depend on one or the other for everything. No, you have to challenge yourself. Struggle for the best. I struggle and I'm now benefiting from it. I never know UK. Now I am in UK because of education. Yes, women out there are discriminated. Not because we are weak or stupid, but because we are not empowered. And education makes one empowered. I am empowered now physically, emotionally, psychologically, and a lot more because I am educated. And comfort has helped me through all these things. And I'm now proud of them. I serve as a role model to a lot of people. Young women came to always come to me for advice. I give them advice. I do a lot of advocacy. I make sure that girls out there take their studies seriously. I could have gone out to look for men to get money in order to go to school. But I said, no, what the man can do, I can equally do it. So I have to struggle to get myself in school. I use my story as case studies to all my fellow girls back in Ghana. I go around do advocacy, teach them about teenage pregnancy contraceptions, how to keep themselves safe from boys. And also, I take gifting auntie, Hawaii Akubu, 
ladies as my role models. So I also entreat them to take girls like me as their role models in order to be well educated and not to go astray. I do a lot of advocacy. I am running a project now called the Safe Delivery Priority for All. I want to make sure that women, pregnant women, get the safest delivery ever. They don't die out of giving birth and they don't lose their babies in the process. So I educate them on good nutrition. I do a lot out there. I do advocacy on um, domestic violence. I'm in the hospital. Whenever a lady comes, a student comes to do abortion, I sit the student down to teach her, tell her to stay away from boys and take her studies very serious in order to be like me. I have gone through a lot and I'm now proud of myself and proud of Comfort as, as well. And soon, Kama, that is the great network, Comfort Alumni, Comfort Association, will soon rule the whole nation because we want to translate change. I am inspired to see change translate among young women worldwide and sooner or later we will rule the whole world. Ghana, we have about 270 parliamentarians, only 90 of them are females. I can equally rule the nation because the hand that stays a pot can equally rule the nation. Thank you very much. for your education. <laughs> you really showed the struggle there. I think you, you heard the appreciation for everybody in the audience. Absolutely fantastic. Um, last speaker, Zoa. Um, coming back more to the UK, can you tell us a bit about your story? Uh, I can. Um, I'm afraid my story um, isn't as dramatic as other people's, but I think it will show that there are still obstacles to education in this country. Um, uh, I apologise, I'm feeling a bit poorly today, uh, so sorry if I get a bit vague or washy. Uh, but yes, I am from the travelling sharing community, which means that my family run travelling fun fairs. Um, we're not gypsies or Irish travellers, we're a separate community to them, but we do face some similar challenges. So travelling showman means that we, we run travelling fun fairs, my family have been doing this uh, since 1821, just as far back as we can trace it. Uh, so, for about 200 years, education hasn't really been important to my people uh, because we have a place where we stay in the winter months and for a good six months of the year, if not more, we would travel from town to town with our funfairs. Uh, and the skills that you needed to get by were just passed down through the family, um, much as they were in the rest of British society, and that was all fine. That was all lovely. Um, until the business started not, not being as profitable. And suddenly, we realised that actually, uh, maybe making candy floss and fun fair rides for half the year, and then just doing maintenance work and looking after your business in the winter months, might not cut it, and that it might actually be worth having some other opportunities and options, um, particularly for me, uh, because my mother was, was, still is, a single parent. Um, and whilst I don't come from a society that's uh, structurally patriarchal or misogynistic, <coughs> um, there's just sort of some basic biological facts that favour men when you've got a business largely based on heavy lifting. Um, so when my mother was raising me by herself, we couldn't have the most profitable fun fair businesses, which are the big flashy rides, the dodgems, the bumper cars, the waltzes, because she just wasn't physically capable of running those. So we had a candy floor store instead, um, which was great. I mean, you can take a bag of sugar and sell it to candy floors. Uh, the profit margins are quite high on candy floss, as you can imagine. It's mostly air. Um, <laughs> but it did mean that our options were limited and my mum remembered uh, shyly asking her parents if she could um, stay on at the, and finish second modern and do her exams and they said to her, don't be silly, he's going to sell the candy floss. 
And so that opportunity was denied her. And then when my father left, she saw for herself that it was difficult um, not being part of a, a, a two-income family. Uh, she struggled and decided to give me some other options, which did require some financial sacrifice. Um, for instance, uh, most people in our business start travelling from February half term, uh, keep going until bonfire season, and then there's a brief short stay in our winter quarters uh, where you do Christmas fairs from home, um, which are horrible, it was really freezing. Um, remember that if you're ever out wine, buy lots of mulled wine. Um, January is when you go on holiday to somewhere hot, and then you start again in February. And my mum gave up a massive chunk of her business by only travelling from Easter holidays till September. She said that I only missed one term. And people told her she was mad. What, what are you doing that for? What are you taking that massive hit for? And so that I could be in school, so that I could have more options. And it wasn't that she didn't want me to go into business, as I say, I've been doing that for 200 years, it's that she wanted me to have the choice about what I could do. And she felt that it was much more important for girls to get an education in our society than it's for boys, because, it, as she said at the end of the day, a boy can walk up to a building site and say, give me a job and be a manual labourer, whereas girls needed more skills because they couldn't sell physical labour in the same way. And what's interesting is that as our business faces more competition, the last few years I've seen parents, <coughs> parents who perhaps couldn't understand what my mother was doing, they've now had their own children and they're thinking, actually yes, we want our children to have choices. And one of the ways to make education more attractive to people from marginalised communities is to make it relevant. Um, for instance, I've got female cousins who have decided themselves that they want to go into education and they're going to college to do things like beauty therapy and nails because that's what excites them. But I've also seen parents really encouraging them to do things like um, plumbing courses, welding, electrical engineering, skills that they can put back into their business and where they can also go into employment if they need to. Things that have a real relevance to what they're doing. I mean, I did a history degree. It's quite obvious that, that wasn't going to be useful enough unfair, arguably. It's not really going to be useful anyway. Um, but by making it relevant, there's a, there's a reason why um, our kids didn't go to school. It was physically difficult when you're travelling for six months a year. And really, what was the point? Because it, it wasn't that there was anything against education, it wasn't that, that we didn't agree with it, it wasn't an idea of you being outside of your community. It's nothing like that, it's just, why? You, you learn on the job. Um, so things have started to change. Um, I was, as far as I know, no, I've, I mean, I've been saying this for years and no one's come to correct me, uh, the first person from my community to go to university having always travelled, having always missed that big gap of the summer term. I have never done a full year at school. Um, I was at Cambridge for four years. By the time I graduated, there were four other people from my community, not university, at Oxbridge. So, I mean, my, my paternal grandfather couldn't read or write because he had lots of brothers and sisters who weren't very well off. He needed to work. So we've gone in three generations from not being able to read or write very well. Although he has now got an iPad, so I think we're, we're coming along um, to the best university in the country. And now a lot more kids are managing to do this because they can see that actually we can do it. It's that idea of being a role model. Before we had oh, it's, you know, it's not for us, or I can do it. Just having one person who, who's real and relatable, saying that actually you can. And things like technology, we've got this brilliant video link up here. I was lucky enough, the Prince's Trust helped me to get a second-hand laptop and some of the very first wireless internet so I could stay in touch with my school. So, things that helped me were my own determination, but the sacrifices my mother was willing to make because she could see the economic argument for it, the case for giving me some independence and not having the struggles that she'd faced. And 
technology support for charities, so that CanFed is helping people. Gave me the chance to do things differently and to keep going and to get my education and then to get my degree. And we can change things. And it's important to know there are still problems in this country. There are still communities like mine and other communities in this country where education isn't seen as important or relevant. And I think we need to think about education as something marketable. I mean, it's quite easy to go to a university. I think education is important for education's sake. Not everyone feels like that. And if we sort of see ed education as something that we need to facilitate, as something that we need to encourage, change the way that people think about it, because you can't do it without the support of people around you. Um, so a, a seven-year-old with the best one in the world can desperately want to go to school, but if, like my family, they have to travel in the summer months to, to make a living, you know, something has to change. Uh, the Tories have, the government, have uh, dramatic cuts and uh, indeed a law change mean that the Travellers Education Service, which helped me, they, I, I had, in the summer I had an hour of schooling once a week, um, like the teachers would come around and look at my books and once I got past primary stage they couldn't really help me much because they were primary school teachers. That's gone now. And it was just little things like that, you know, someone coming around and telling my mum that, you know, she was doing the right thing and supporting her when everyone around just was like, well, I remember being uh, at a family, uh, I wasn't at a family christening, my mother was there, and so I said, why is, why is Zoe not here? Oh, she's, you know, it's a, it's a Monday and she's in school. So she's 18, what should we go to school for? And just having that structural support, um, which is now being lost, uh, was really valuable. So it's support network, networks in place, it's selling the idea of education to families, showing them that it's <coughs> useful and making it relevant. And even when there aren't, when there isn't horrible violence, things like that keeping people away, there are still um, social and economical problems that need to be faced. Um, but I'm proof that we can get around those. So I think um, overall it's, it's a positive message yeah. that I have. Sorry, I've not been aware of time. <laughs> right. No, it's very interesting. We don't, we, that's fine, Zoe. That's, that's absolutely great. Let's give her a minute. I would love to give you loads of time for ask questions, but we are going to have to reconnect in about five minutes. But let's have a go at a few questions to just get, get you involved in this. I'm really sorry, but with a late start, we're, you know, we're due on this reconnection. But who wants to get in and ask me? Um, person, a woman over there at the back. Yep. Mics? No. Yep. Yeah, a second, yeah, second row, who was waving for me? Oh, sorry. I thought it was a girl, that, it's a young man behind. There you are, there you are. That's happened before, don't worry. Go for it. Yeah. That's my group. Um, <laughs> my, name, my name's Kieran, my, I'm actually one of Pauline's students, so I should probably... Um, I have some, some biases or something. Um, I, perhaps a question, particularly for, for Mariam. Um, I'm studying uh, Pakistan and education, which is why I'm asking this question. But, um, We've heard a lot about women's empowerment and how it's very important to empower girls and, and, and that's a huge part of uh, uh, what we're all doing. Uh, and now uh, with Zoe mentioned the sort of the structural challenges and it, and it seems to me that a lot of girls are, are incredibly empowered. Um, but I wonder what we need to do to empower men, in essence, to allow women. And you, you with a wry smile, said that men are scared of empowered women and I think that to, to to a large extent, that's, that's true. Um, so, so I wonder what we need to be doing with, with men as well. Yeah, I, I discussed it yesterday in our panel discussion that uh, I have noticed that there are many NGOs and many organizations working on uh, female uh, education. They have set some goal uh, for themselves. Um, the international community is partici participating very well. But uh, I feel somewhere deep inside that in being a part of a male-dominated society, it's, uh, it's my father who is going to allow me to get education 
either he's going to allow me or he's not going to allow me. So I feel that to change the society, we have to change the mentality and the approach towards education uh, of the men. Like men needs to be uh, educated first. In our society, I'm talking about my society, I belong from a Pashtun uh, culture. Um, and uh, if my father is not educated, he will never encourage me to get education. So even if our fathers, forefathers, uh, grandfathers, they are not educated, uh, they need to get education uh, just in order to encourage their girls to get education. Uh, I, I really feel like that. Like if my husband isn't educated, so he would never be here standing and uh, si sitting in front of me. It's him, it's his education that he has uh, never been a hurdle in my progress, in my success. So I think men need uh, education and uh, women can contribute a lot in educating them. <laughs> Question from a woman. <laughs> I'll go on because we've got very little time, so come on, come on in. Climb on in, sorry. I can answer. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about um, the government providing the kind of basic facilities for schools and things like that. And I was wondering um, how you think it's most effective for NGOs to work with the government or whether it's better for NGOs to be kind of more directly involved in terms of providing education, and maybe also whether there's an, a barrier to, um, to the provision of education in perhaps the kind of just building schools way um, from a cultural perspective of whether people will actually attend them once people have built them. So really a bit two questions. Do you, do you want to have a go at um, the government and NGOs? Lucy, maybe? Sure. Well, we, we're, our primary partner in any country is with the government in that we're looking at how do you get access to the national school system and how do you push up the quality of the school system and we have been invited in by a number of ministries of education because they recognize the value of that NGO bridge if you like between the government school system and the wider community recognizing that for girls to get into the school system there's a whole lot of barriers outside the school gates and so that partnership is absolutely fundamental and I think that there is real value and synergy when that partnership is got right between the government and NGOs and pushing up the quality of education and enabling more children and marginalised children to get access to that education. And there's a bit of on, on culture. Does anybody want to take that one? Um, so, I, can, yeah. I can talk about that. Um, one of the things that was lovely with the Travellers Education Service was that there weren't very many teachers, but that they could work as a liaison with the local schools that we attended. Um, because obviously we're a very small community, it's not really feasible or fair to expect all teachers across the country to be trained in our issues and our culture. But um, we had a wonderful uh, woman called Sue Cox who was able to go in and just explain to teachers, uh, this is why Zoa seems really good at maths, and then you'll find a massive gaping hole in her algebra knowledge, for instance, and explain that you know she, she might be you know, great at French and then rubbish at the subjunctive because she missed that term. <laughs> so just having someone who was government mandated to go in and act as a liaison and explain the issues that we had was really useful. Um, <coughs> for instance, my, my little cousin, when she was in the school play, um, they specifically wrote a role for her that was someone who was a traveller who was travelling about from place to place, which made her feel really welcome. So little acts of inclusion like that can be really useful and um, obviously they do have to come from within organisations. I'm, I'm going to take a last one, and, and can I have some guidance? Yeah, that we, we, we need to be on to already, or or now, or now. Okay, um, okay, guys. Um, can we please be connected with London and see what they're doing? Right. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> does that mean we can have more questions? Let's do one more and then see if, if you if, you, if somebody would shout and let me know when we if they are starting to come through go for it. Um, so I've been completely inspired by all of you today. What can I do now? Like going home, how can I take this further? How can I support these causes? What's the best thing that I can do? 
Well, you could, you could go on the hashtag, up the school. Mm. <laughs> We've done that. <laughs> um, I, I have a suggestion. Whereabouts do you live? And do you have a spare room? Because as someone from a working... I'm not asking to move in. But <laughs> as someone from a working class background um, with very few connections outside of my own uh, sort of small world, um, one of the greatest barriers to getting into my career was being able to do internships. And I was very lucky to have people who offered spare rooms or sofas that I could sleep on for a week so that I could have the kind of opportunities that people who lived in London could take for granted. So I was going to say, if there's anyone who lives in London or Cambridge or another city who does want to help people with an educational disadvantage, you know, ask your friends, do you know anyone who's looking for a place to say, do you know anyone who might, a young person who might want to come and do an internship at my company? I think that's a, you know, help them get their foot in the door. Thanks. Pauline. I think that's a very practical suggestion. I think also more broadly, as we've been hearing, a lot of this is to do with governments, and governments have the power to change things. Now, maybe our government here doesn't have the power to fully change what's happening in Pakistan or Ghana, but what it does in the next round of um, post-elections will make a difference. So you're going to have MPs knocking on your door. One question you can ask each of them is what are they going to do to ensure every girl has access to a good quality of education by 2030 and see what their response is and then decide how you and your families should take things forward. Does anybody else want to say? I could just, yeah, just to put one it. final point on that last question, which is I think that you know, in all the stories that we're hearing about fanatics attacking schools, as we've heard from you, Mariam, and, and in other places like Nigeria. I mean, the fanatics are one step ahead in recognising and fearing the transformative power of girls' education, that their greatest fear isn't, you know, drones with missiles, it is girls reading books. And I think whatever we can do in terms of supporting girls to go to school is going to challenge that, because we recognise the power, the transformative power of girls' education, and we need to get behind it. Uh, London, are you ready to talk to us? We do have just a few minutes, and, and, I, and I think it is quite important to, to sort of close this, you know, properly with a sort of just reflection on what's happened. So, in fact, we, we had three of our group ready to answer the three questions we were given by, you know, listening to what people were saying here. Mariam, you were going to just lead off, and, and this is very briefly, a couple of minutes um, on these. Can you just summarise for us why girls' education matters so much? Yes, I think girls' education uh, matters because I know how it changed my life and the life of my friends uh, who were fortunate to get, get education. In the most extreme religious and patriarchal society, uh, when you come across a woman, a girl, who is uh, socially very active, politically active, and uh, economically independent, the only thing you know about her is her access to education. So education uh, gives us, uh, realizes us our right, and it gives us confidence to stand for it. So I think it, it transforms lives, it, it transforms uh, societies. So yes, it does matter. If, if a girl is not educated, she can't <coughs> contribute to her family. Like, she can't, uh, she can't support her family very well. Uh, in, in, I'm not talking in terms of money. That's not that much important. It's like nourishing your child, bringing up your child, bringing up your husband, your father, <coughs> taking care of your society. So I'm, uh, it's all about that. Yeah. So yes, it does matter. So, but women have rights to education. Yeah. And with education, they're going to change the world. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now, Fatima, you're going to say, can you say something about what can be, be done to help more girls be in school? What gets in the way? What could change that? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, most girls out there, especially those in my country, need a lot of um, role models, female role models. Yeah, we can all serve as role models to our sisters out there. They need good role models in order to pick up weight. So because of this, I go around schools and I educate them a lot about the importance of female education. And I use, always use myself as an example. Even without, it's not only the girls, but sometimes you have to tell the both boys and girls, educate them more about, because they also have sisters back at home. 
In our country, they think female, the important thing for you is just to get married, start giving birth to children, just take care of the house choices. They think you are just to be in the kitchen. By you being educated, it's no important. It's the man who takes care of the family. But the thing is, when female gets educated, all the children, all the family, it transforms everybody in the family. Yes, the, the woman takes care of the children. She makes sure that they go to school very well. So it's when we take ourselves as good role models, talk to others, and even live an exemplary life, be ready to con con confront other people and network very well. And that is what we common members are doing. We network a lot in order to get young girls in the line so that we will lead greatly in future. So it is important to be good role models and make sure that we educate them on teenage pregnancy. That is what I do. Domestic violence, violence against women, they don't know their rights. You educate them about their rights. All this thing will help them be in school and take their studies very serious. So I do all these advocacies with my Kama, other Kama members in Ghana. Yeah. So it helps a lot. Yeah. And role models and getting women together and doing advocacy. Yes. Yeah. So I would like to say one thing that uh, in order to ensure that every girl goes to school, I think that uh, the government should uh, should put some strict legislation for the girls, for the fathers and mothers, the parents, the society, that if a girl is not going to school, they are liable to some, yeah. uh, they, they are going to answer yeah. for that. So, so making it illegal right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, this yeah. should happen. Like, when I came to England, I was asked that, is your child going to school? Yeah. That was, I, I was very impressed. So the same thing should be in Pakistan and all other uh, developing countries. countries. There should be strict legislation, and it, the legislation, it should not be in black and white. The, uh, the most important thing is its impl uh, implementation yeah. and enforcement. Yeah. So there should be monitoring regarding the dropout or absence of the students, girl students especially. The good laws <coughs> and taking yeah. it seriously. And yeah. With what Maria has just said, yeah, it's, it's important that way, but sometimes, like in my country, they said education is free in the basic level, which most girls and most students go to the basic level only. But when you get to the junior school or the senior high school, there comes the problem because the poverty rate there is very great. So we need people to help us. It's not that we don't want to go to school, but the money to go to school, we need support. Girls are out there in Ghana, just like me, they are willing to go. but. How do they do that? Yes, the laws will be there for every girl to go to school, but the thing is, the family don't have enough to support the child go to school. So it's good we network with other NGOs in order to help the poor, the developing country to pick up with education. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Which comes back to some of the countries where they are now giving out money, yeah. in effect payments to families so that their children can go to school, for them and so on. But last question, I'm going to turn to Pauline for that, which is, okay, us lot outside those countries. Um, you started off that, I think, in answering that question, but a bit more on what we can all do. So I think we've heard from some amazing women here with some amazing stories, and we know that there are many more amazing women around the world, some of whom have not had their chance to tell their story and in their lifetime might not be able to do it if we don't do something about it. Now, some things we can't do, it has to happen within the countries, but there is a lot we can do as well. First of all, you've heard these amazing stories. You go and talk to your family and friends about these issues. Make sure that in your networks that others are also aware of it, that that then creates a body. So I think the network isn't only, shouldn't only be happening in Ghana and Pakistan, but should also be happening here that through that network, people are aware you can campaign through NGOs, whether it's through NGOs like CAMFED, through NGOs like Oxfam, Save the Children. There's lots of things going out on out there that you can support. You can also make sure that your government, our government, is aware of these challenges. They are aware, but that not only are they aware that they are committed to doing something about it and that it's top of their agenda to do something about it. 
And to do that, you can sign the Up for School petition, which is outside, and it's on the website. Three million people have signed it already. As I said, this ranges from school children in different countries around the world to world leaders. So please add your name to that petition. And that petition can help to make a difference, to make clear that this isn't only an issue for people in remote rural areas in particular countries. It is a global issue that we are all concerned about. Thank you. Now, just before, wait a minute, don't hold, hold it, because I'm just trying to find out what's happening in London. Um, London, can you hear us now? We, yeah, we've actually been listening in for a while, sneaking. Okay, jolly good. Um, in that case, I, I've been told we can go on here just for five minutes, but no longer. So it would be lovely if you've been hearing us. Could you just, in less than five minutes, just on the three questions that we had, can you just say um, just something from your end about, you know, obviously we'll get your points of view in then about um, why education for girls matters, what you get out, do to get over the, the practical blocks, and then what we can do outside? Could, could you do that in just under five minutes for us? I don't know whether, yes. Christian, whether you want to do three different people or you're going to summarise. I, I, think, I think probably I'll, because we've, we've done a lot on, on why education matters so much. If I can just summarise what we think um, can be done to keep girls in school um, and, and get more, more girls in school. And then I'm going to ask um, one of our panellists here, Francesca, just to talk about how more people can, can get engaged and what can they do. Um, so we talked a lot about, um, you know, uh, uh, overcoming the, the silence, um, especially within um, emergency jet zones. It's about nations coming together. Um, we heard about a lot about how we need to engage more the youth voice and important the youth voice in, in getting um, getting the agenda on the table of world leaders um, and and uh, you know campaigns like the up for school campaign um, engaging the community outside more um, engaging parents whether even if that's in the UK or globally um, engaging the community is 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 really important. Um, an understanding that school is more than just a school, whether that is in the UK or whether that's globally. The school is, it's a safe space, creating safe spaces for girls. But it's also that community hub where, you know, we're asking teachers to be more than just teachers um, in a girl's life. So we've had a fantastic discussion um, here. Um, Francesca, who's a, a global youth ambassador, um, spoke very passionately about um, how she thinks everyone can play their part, um, and I'm just going to hand over to her very quickly to, to, to summarise that. Um, one of the ways that we can play our part just here today, I believe we have some petitions at the door in London, but if everyone would sign their name and say that you are up for school and that you believe that the 58 million children in the world should have access to school, and you could also take a book away and ask people to sign it, because you sign it, you spread that message to someone else, and they do the same thing, means again that we're able to amplify our voice, so that one, you one person, then has an impact on many other people, and they use their circles of influence to do the same thing, to make sure that we give the voice to that one person in a rural area somewhere who may never ever get to a decision maker's table, but we are using our influence and our platform to give that person a voice. Great, thank you very much, and you've been very good on keeping it brief. So um, it's great to, to um, that know that we are both, you know, places, London and Cambridge, that we've all been really having a great discussion on all these issues, as too was absolutely fantastic, especially some of the bravery and power of the women that at both ends, you know, in trying to do the things that they can to both make sure that, in some cases, they got education themselves at all and the struggle they had, or the others who are trying to make sure that happens for girls. So um, we're all in this together, and um, although it's been a bit intermittent, it's been, it's been great that we're both in London and Cambridge, and all these people are thinking about the same issue at the same time. So big round of applause at both ends. Thank Woo! you. for Women of the World for organising such a fantastic yeah. festival this year. I'm the, first, I'm the first one in Cambridge and we're determined it's going to go on. <laughs> Thank you very much and bye-bye London. Thank you, bye-bye Cambridge. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you everybody.